Yes, we, um, we do try to find the balance. As you can imagine, we have to find the balance between what's best for a learning environment for our students and how, how to have the safety and security in there. So we're always looking for the balances um, for how that is, because we get phone calls often that say, we went too far. And then we'll get a phone call and say, we didn't go far enough. So we're always trying to watch and um, monitor what it is that we're needing to do in order to make sure we keep a safe and secure, but um, a great learning environment for our students. And as you can see on the stage, we talk about the five phases of emergency management. When we work in and plan and practice our emergency response plan, we have all of these five phases in those plans and in those drills and in the way that we train and the way that we um, work with our students and staff. We try to stay in the prevention, mitigation, and preparedness because if we can stay in that role, we're not having to do the response and the recovery. So we try to stay where we're trying to prevent and trying to mitigate any of the things that could be um, something that could cause harm to a campus or to our staff and students. Um, Russell, do you have anything you want to say on that? Okay. So how do we take our emergency plan and how we respond to uh, an incident? And an incident can be anything that causes a disruption um, to the school day or to uh, cause any kind of uh, interruption to the way that our building is operating. So we have adopted what the state has adopted is the uh, SRP, the Standard Response Protocol. And everything that we do when we're looking at our emergency plans, our drills and so forth is that we make sure that we uh, are following this protocol. So you have the evacuation, you have the secure, which is the lockout. That can be um, for like something that's going on in the neighborhood and to keep it from coming into our schools, we lock um, the front door so that we know that we're secure and can continue to uh, have a normal school day and go ahead and function. Um, can't have our activities outside, but we can go ahead and keep our students in the learning mode moving forward. Lockdown is when we have a threat that's threatening what's going on inside of our building. And so um, we have protocols, trainings, and drills that we follow um, for that. And then we have the um, evacuation for uh, if we would have a fire or another reason why the building itself is not safe for us to remain in the building. So then we have the evacuation. And then finally, the shelter. The shelter is either for a weather event, such as a tornado, high wind, anything that could cause that kind of a stressor. And then we also have it for uh, any kind of a hazardous release or a spill or something that uh, could happen. So we, we practice all of these drills um, and we have response plans uh, throughout our emergency operation plan for how we're going to handle um, these different events. And, and if you notice this, this plan of action, the, the five different modes of, of protocols is the beginning of a great partnership with who you see up front here because without this this was began or started back in the day when um, the parents who actually run the I love you guys foundation their own child was involved into a hostage situation at school years ago um, through that event though um, they realized that the communications wasn't the best you know, we all have our acronyms. If you get in education, you know that's true. If you get into law enforcement, the fire departments all have their language and the language weren't coming together. This has been a great tool for us, not only for our partners who actually uh, use the same um, protocols as when we say a, a secure, it's different from a lockdown versus police activity on the outside or the dangers on the inside. And so with that said, we use these protocols um, as our partners are able to understand what's happening in our locations and our campuses. And with that said, we also use these protocols or a staff when we say uh, tabletops, for example. These are exercises that we promote and, and have our staff conduct at their campuses with their staff. And it's, in other words, it's a what if situation. What if you saw this happening? What would you do? Which protocol would you pull out and use an example with your staff? And we know as in law enforcement and fire departments, this is something you're, you're trained to do all the time is practice in your mind. The more you practice something in your mind, 
and you don't have to go to an all-out event and get students involved. You can actually sit down at a table with your staff and discuss how you, what actions you would take. So this has been very, um, very important for us to, to go with this plan is you know it's still going to be chaos when in any event that's a that that is not a personal maybe attack of some sort an attack could be a tornado right so we need to have a plan for that uh, an attack could be a student or staff or someone from the outside in any form and so when we we have these situations we go right to this and say staff we practice this what would you use what protocol and how would you so it's a plan that to, to get by time from the attack itself. So then we have to um, think through when we do have a response and we have to uh, respond to an event, then we have to make sure we have good communications. How are we going to communicate to our parents? How are we going to communicate to our community on what's going on and keeping them updated? The trick sometimes to that, too, is telling you that there is something that is, that is happening but not giving too much details until we have an opportunity to work with our partners who may be responding with us and know what exactly it is to send out that information. But we also know that it's a key um, to making sure that we're balancing how much information we're giving out and how frequently and the timing of giving that out. But as you can uh, understand is sometimes when things are unfolding, the information changes, and so we always have to make sure that we're trying to give you true and accurate information as we process through um, one of our events. The standard reunification method is the way that um, we handle if we were if we weren't able to release through a normal school day on campus or off campus at another site, we use the I love you guys um, best practice methods again um, that the state has adopted for how we're going to manage that. So if we can keep everybody on campus, but we have to release early because um, it's not safe for them to stay there, then we'll stay and we'll work through those communications and, and work through with the parents on how they can pick up and reunify with their students. If the site is not deemed safe and we're going to have to move them to another site, we have plans in place, know exactly where we're going to be taking them, um, depending on what the uh, event is. We have four or five different locations that we would know that we would use. Again, you would have to know, well, which way would you go depending on what's happening before we can tell you. That's why it's not disclosed ahead of time where would those sites be. Um, because we would need to know what would our uh, support and partnership be able to get the traffic and get people there and manage all that. So we would make those decisions um, based on that. The, um, the anonymous alerts is the communication tool that we have that's on our website for if and, uh, anybody knows anything that needs to be shared with the district that we need to uh, investigate, check, vet, and find out that information. So we use anonymous alerts to uh, be able to get any of those uh, tips that we need to follow up on um, and see if we can take care of. And again, that would be, again, in the prevention mode of trying to prevent from something uh, moving forward if somebody has information that they can share with us. <laughs> 